Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. And today for animal biology, we're going to talk about mollusca. So that phyla and the class Cephalopoda. We're also going to talk about a couple other classes um, that are much smaller, um, just kind of to give you an idea of how diverse and how variable the phyla mollusca is. Okay? But Cephalopoda first. Cephalopods are things like uh, squid, octopus, nautilus, um, cuttlefish. These guys are what belong to the cephalopoda. Very, very different than the other two classes we talked about, the gastropods and the bivalves. Okay? So first, let's talk a little bit about cephalopods. Like I said before, squid, octopus, cuttlefish, nautilus. Okay? Um, instead of having a foot, the foot has been modified into tentacles okay, and arms or arms and they incorporate a siphon. Okay. So again, when we looked at you know the siphon that we see in bivalves, it's still present in cephalopoda, okay, but the siphon is not used for um, filter feeding, but instead used for locomotion. Okay. The head is in line with the visceral mass now, so you get kind of a, a migration of the body parts a little bit. Okay. So it's a more streamlined body. The mantle is extremely muscular, and so most of these organisms, except for Nautilus, um, either have a very reduced shell or no shell at all okay? and making up for that would be a strong muscular outer surface or mu muscular mantle okay? so if we look at some of the internal structures it's going to be uh, quite a bit different than gastropods and bivalves here's that modified foot um, in the formation of tentacles okay? or arms that are um, Ex, you know, uh, end in tentacles, I guess you could say. Okay. They have a true mouth, which is kind of hidden here. The mouth itself is going to have a beak. Uh, so it has, instead of um, kind of rasping mouth parts, uh, they will also, most of them also have a radula, so a rasping mouth part, and kind of, and they use that as a tongue or to help with. Uh, removing flesh from the organism that they consume. These are predatory organisms, so they have a beak, they'll bite down, and then remove flesh with that radula. Okay. The siphon there allows for them to move throughout the water column. They can also use their tentacles to kind of walk and, and, uh, and progress um, along you know substrate and things like that, but for swimming motion, typically it's the siphon that is used. Again, that mount, mantle is very muscular. Um, that material, siphon, is also where the anus kind of dumps. So you have a mouth that comes in into the intestines, up into the stomach, okay? and you know you have digestive organs okay, or di digestive uh, glands, and then back out through the siphon. Okay. Um, they have a pair of gills and kind of three hearts. So each gill is ran by what we call a branchial heart. Okay. And then you have a central heart or a systemic heart that um, will run uh, you know, the blood through the body. So you have oxygenated blood that's coming out of the gills, into the heart and then gets flown into or pushed into the system. Now, the thing about cephalopods, cephalopods have a closed circulatory system. Okay, so they actually have veins, they have arteries, and they have capillary beds. Okay, so it's a closed system, much more efficient than the gastropod and bivalve open circulatory system. Okay, so there's really no mixing of um, non-oxygenated Okay, or oxygen deficient blood and oxygen efficient blood. 
Okay. The rest of it is fairly similar. Um, they have a true kidney, uh, which helps with for, um, filtration, uh, digestive um, cecum, and things like that, which we didn't, we haven't really seen up to this point. So much more advanced body feature, okay? and we haven't even talked about the sensory organs, which we will get to in, in a little bit. Okay, so the class cephalopoda, um, like I said before, that excrement of the mantle is normally very reduced or absent, okay, except for nautilus, which was I showed you a picture of at the very beginning. Okay, nautilus has an external shell. All the rest, cuttlefish, octopus, squid, either the shell is internal and very reduced or it's completely absent. Locomotion is done through jet propulsion. Jet propulsion meaning that water is sucked into the siphon, into the mantle cavity, and then pressed out of the mantle cavity, out through the siphon um, in the form of kind of a jet, water jet. Um, and that's part of that muscle of the mantle being able to flex and compress allows for them to move through the water. Feeding, like I said before, these guys are predators. And they have tentacles, and in some um, species, they actually have feeding tentacles. Okay, and so they have different set of tentacles for different kind of purposes. Um, jaws, again, they have a beak, which is going to be modified shell material. Okay, with a radula, so a rasping kind of tongue, a dotifer, which is cartilage on it, which allows for it to rasp away flesh and then they can digest it. Okay? Again, cephalopods have a true digestive system. They have a muscular digestive tract which allows for them to churn material in their stomach. Okay? They have digestive glands which allows for you know, uh, di digestive enzymes okay, to come in and digest the material. Okay? And here you can see kind of the tentacles and the arms um, um, in, in kind of you know this wrapping motion around this this object here okay? but I want to draw attention to their eye so the eye is very unique remember when we we're looking at um, gastropods they have eyes on the end of a tentacle stalk or on the end of a kind of like an antennae like stalk okay? um, and I told you that their eyes are pretty poor no, um, they do have a lens, but no real depth of field. You can't tell the object or anything like that. Um, cephalopods are very different. Okay? And bivalves don't have eyes at all. So cephalopods, very, very different. Cephalopods have excellent eyesight. Um, probably to the degree that their eyesight is even better than human eyesight. Okay? And we'll come back to that. So the closed circulatory system. Their nervous system is also different. Instead of multiple ganglii, they have a single large brain. Okay? On top of that, their brain is um, it's lobed. Okay? And so there's actually definition to it. And there, there's always this comment, especially from young students, like um, when we talk about human evolution, we talk about our brains getting bigger, bigger compared to our ancestors, Octopithecus or even um, chimpanzee brain, our brain is much larger. The size of the brain is not actually determining the intelligence of the individual or the organism. Okay? It's how many lobes or how many projections you have, what's the surface area look like, how many connections you have. That tells us, you know, kind of the intelligence level of an organism. So cephalopods have a large brain for their body size, okay? but they also have a lot of lobes and they have some definition to the brain, which is probably adding to the complexity of the organism and adds to their intelligence. Cephalopods are extremely intelligent. Okay? Um, the other things that are going on that we don't see in other mol mollusks is that they have these complex sensory structures. So their eyes are complex. Okay? Excellent eyes. They have statuses. So this ability to know 
which way up is and down. It's like a gyroscope inside their body and allows for them to keep balance and things like that. Okay? On top of that, they have what we call chromatophores. Okay? And chromatophores are pigment cells that occur at the most outer edge of the organism's epidermis. Okay? And it allows for them to um, camouflage themselves, but also allows for them to court and allows for them to communicate okay? and lots of other situations, um, uses for the chromatophores, things that we don't even, we're not even sure they're doing yet um, with their chromatophores, but a very advanced system. They also have an ink gland, okay, which allows for them, it's normally kind of predator deterrent, so they'll expel the ink okay, to kind of um, confuse the predator and then escape. However, some of the species within Cephalopoda have utilized their ink gland as a hunting mechanism also. So they'll excrete the ink gland to confuse their prey and then consume the prey. Right. Back to the cephalopod eye. So there are a couple things that are going on that are, that are unique and in some cases make their eye more efficient and better than our eye. So if you look at a human eye, and so he, first I have to preface this. Okay? Humans evolved, okay, um, a eye in our eye in kind of a different track than cephalopods did. The last common ancestor that cephalopods shared with humans, okay, was a blind worm. Right? So the evolution of the eye in those two groups are not connected at all. Okay? So the organism that we share an ancestor with, encephalopod, didn't have an eye at all. Okay? They didn't even have that sensory structure. So this is convergent evolution. We both converged on a structure of the eye. Cephalopod design is better than human design, better than mammal design. Okay? In the sense and well, and matter of fact, better than vertebrate design. Okay? And here's the reason why. The eye itself is very, very similar. Okay? So you have lens, cornea, iris, okay, everything that you would find in a human eye, retina, cones, rods, everything same. Okay? Except for in the cephalopod eye, the optical nerve, okay, or optical nerves run behind the retina. In the human eye, and so does the blood vessels, okay? in the human eye, the nerves run through um, this region in front of the retina, and so does the blood. Okay? And this is why if you're, you know, maybe you're, you're playing sports or you're running a lot, you sit down and you stand up and you start to see stars, okay? spots. Okay? That's because blood flow is now going back through the eye, and you're starting to get um, light or photons bouncing off of blood uh, uh, blood cells, and you're kind of getting these spots, okay? And you get that constriction of the blood, and then the release of the blood causing blurry vision. Okay? Cephalopods do not have that issue because all blood, all nerves run behind the eye. It's a much, much more efficient design, okay? Um, but again, this is convergent evolution. Vertebrates evolved an eye in one way, and then cephalopods evolved an eye in a different way, okay? They're not connected. There are two different designs. It just happens to be that one, in most people's opinion, is a better design, okay? Because of um, interference purposes. So when we talk about cephalopods, there's also other things that are going on that make them a very interesting group. So remember, the last time we shared an ancestor with them was a blind worm. Okay? But they have developed the ability to learn. Okay? And their intelligence is probably um, better than any invertebrate on the planet any other invertebrate. And most vertebrates 
they're they're more intelligent then. Okay? So again, this is convergent evolution at, at its best. We're talking about blind worm ancestry, and you got one group that's evolving on one path, ability to learn, ability to communicate, ability to do lots of things, see, all kinds of things. And another group, same thing, learn, communicate, see, etc. They, they evolved separate of one another. Okay. Most likely, the ability to learn and communicate and adapt um, was a response or is a response to being a predator. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm gonna watch. You're gonna watch a little video here, a little clip of an octopus kind of solving a, a puzzle. Now, I think you probably agree that humans could solve this also, but you got to remember that the octopus itself is fairly young. Okay? Th this individual is fairly young, so it'd be like having maybe a three-year-old child and a three-year-old octopus try to solve this problem at the same time or doing the same kind of thing. So kind of put it into perspective. Okay, so there you can see the octopus cannot see through this. So um, this is kind of a blackout glass. So it can't, it couldn't see the angle at which the rod was placed. So the rod could have been placed down. It could have been placed right, left, up. Doesn't really matter. You can see the octopus um, has the ability. So first of all, you can see its tentacle go through, and I'll show you this again. Tentacle goes through, it deciphers what angle the plastic is at, and then pulls it through. Okay, so watch it again, um, showing a ability to learn, but also the ability to solve puzzles um, very quickly. Okay? Probably quicker than a human would um, of the same age. Okay, so there's been lots of other examples um, and a lot more research that has been done, um, including use of chromatophores in the sense that um, octopus and squid have the ability to tell a researcher when they're hungry, and in some cases, tell the researcher um, what type of food they might prefer by using different color chromatophore flashes. So they have flashing the communication. Now again, they have to be taught how to communicate with us because we don't have the ability to change color and we don't have the ability to communicate with them. But once they're taught um, to communicate a certain color for a certain food type or whether or not they're hungry or in an environment they want to go to, etc., um, they, they have that capability of basically asking for a food or deciphering what food they want or whether or not they want food, etc. Um, so fairly unique situation, um, a very unique group of organisms, and we're just starting to kind of dive into what makes cephalopods so very different than gastropods and bivalves and makes them the most intelligent invertebrate on the planet. Okay, so let's talk about reproduction. Reproduction is also very unique in cephalopods compared to the other molluscans. Okay, they're dioecious, male and females. The male will produce a spermatophore. The male actually has a spermatophore gland and it has a penis. Okay, and the spermatophore gland is attached to the penis, and then that, that spermatophore will be released into the penis, and then the pen penis 
will release the spermatophore. The male has a heterocircalous um, tentacle, okay? a specialized tentacle that has kind of a, a groove of lines that occur at the tip. So instead of having suctions, its tip is got kind of, I don't know what you would call it, um, kind of like indentations, which can hold a spermatophore. So the heteroclotus will go into the mantle, grab the spermatophore, and then the male can then transfer the spermatophore into the female's mantle cavity, and the female has the ability to then fertilize her eggs. Depending on the species, okay, eggs can be deposited singly or masses, but one thing is always, not always, but majority of the time is true, they have parental care. Okay, so up to this point, this is the first group that we see that has true parental care. The female will um, sit next to the eggs, Okay, and guard the eggs. She'll also use her siphon to flush the eggs with fresh water so the eggs don't become stagnant and you don't get um, algae or anything like that building up on the egg masses. Now, after the female produces the eggs and she'll live for a little while basically until they hatch, the female actually dies. The male dies also, but normally the male dies away from the um, the egg mass. Sometimes the male and the female will both tend to the eggs, but most of the time the male is just donating the spermatophore and then he'll die later. Um, but nonetheless, this is really the first group that we see that have parental care. Um, and that probably accounts for a little bit of the intelligent level of the um, cephalopods. Okay. All right. So moving away from cephalopods, super interesting group. Most people think that um, you know that it's a, a interesting group in the sense that they belong with all these other mollusks, which are not intelligent, which do not have parental care, which have open open circulatory systems, incomplete digestive tracts, etc. And then you get this cephalopod group, which is just amazing with communication and sensory and all this. Okay, Some of the other groups that occur um, that are important maybe as food resources and just important for the evolution of mollusca. One is Polypocophora or the chitons. Okay? The chitons are very similar to bivalves okay? except for they don't have a bottom half of the shell. So they just have a top, a dorsal shell Okay. And then the foot has been extended, and it's more flattened, and it basically covers the entire um, ventral surface of the shell. You'll see what I mean when I when I show you a picture. Okay, they feed on algae and things like that with the radula, just like you would see in you know gastropods scraping the material. So they have the ability to move with their foot. Okay. Um, except for the shell covers the entire foot. They have a little bit different nervous system. Um, we call it a ladder-like nervous system because they have multiple ganglia, and the ganglia are kind of nerve net out um, in the different regions of the organism's body. So they have this, you know, multiple uh, rung kind of nervous system and each rung is controlled by a ganglia. Again, aquatic organisms, they're dioecious, they have external fertilization, uh, pretty simple system. So, kind of like the bivalves in the sense that they have a top shell, okay? but also kind of like the gastropods in the sense that their foot is used for moving. Okay? So, um, they have this top mantle shell Okay. The foot is extended across the entire ventral surface. Okay. They have a mouth, they have a radula, okay. and they can move through the system. Okay. Again, they have this ladder-like nervous system. It's kind of controlled by a nerve ring 
that occurs in the anterior portion of the organism or the head of the organism um, and then it, it trickles down. Okay? So very very similar to kind of this cross between bivalves and the gastropods is polypocophora. Okay? Scaphophoidae and these are the tusk shells or the two shell okay? also related um, and, and you can see the distinct relation to gastropods. Okay? They're marine, they burrow, okay? um, as you can assume if they're called the two shells or the tusk shells they have a clonical shell so an extended shell um, but the uniqueness here is it's open on both ends so the digestive tract goes mouth to anus and excretion out the other end. Okay. Dioecious, they have trochophore and volugular larvae. So this is very similar um, to what you would see in the bivalves, where they have a trochophore larvae, which then converts into a volugular larvae. And you can kind of see here, this is a, a tusk shell or a tusk or organism. Okay, they have opening here, opening here. This is the mouth region. Okay. Um, and they would consume paraphyton, algae, that kind of stuff, and then out the anus would be digestive products. So again, a lot of these organisms are similar. That one outgroup, cephalopoda, is very, very different than all the rest of the classes within mollusca. Okay. So what is it about this group? Okay. Well, first of all, they're ancient. Okay well over 500 million years old, okay? older than dinosaurs. They're definitely on the planet when dinosaurs were around. Okay? They've been around. They've evolved for a lot, a long time. So some of those features that we see in those organisms have been changing for hundreds of millions of years. They are lophotrichozoans. Whether they all fit uh, kind of in lophotrichozoa it's kind of difficult um, and like I said before Lophotrichozoa is a contentious kind of grouping um, you're grouping organisms that don't have ganglia at all and just well okay they have a ganglia but um, it's not part not controlling a bunch of sensory systems all the way to a group uh, organism that has a true brain controls a good uh, you know a good eye design, controls chromatophores, controls um, lots of things, statosis, etc. And so you, you have this very large gamut of organisms that fall under, under Lophotrichozoa. Okay. The other thing that we often talk about and need to talk about is that the shell and the muscular foot is not ancestral. These are derived characters. Okay. These are synapomorphies. Um, the organism that gave rise to modern mollusks okay, were worm-like organisms without shells. Okay? And so the solenogasters, okay, they had spiracles. Okay? So just like the sponges, okay, they had spiracles, these little projections with inside their, their mantle or with inside the epidermis. And that was I guess similar to the shell material. Okay? And if you build up enough they had this outer kind of layer of protection. The first time or the first group that we see a muscular foot is polypocophora, okay? that group that, of chitons that we talked about just a second ago. They gave rise to gastropoda okay? or their ancestors gave rise to gastropoda. The other thing is is there's a lot of classes they're fairly different from each other um, in the sense of physical features um, with some being very different but the diversification happened extremely fast okay? probably happened at a time period in the history of the planet where organisms were migrating from um, marine habitat into terrestrial habitat so gastropods moved in okay um, marine organisms moved into freshwater. Okay? Uh, there's a lot more explosion of things like invertebrates and things like that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Okay? 
that probably allowed some of the organisms to go completely as predators and consume things. Fish explosion occurred at this time also, so some of those things were being coming predators and consuming fish material, etc. So you get this diversification very quickly. So that brings us to a possible phylogenetic tree or cladogram, okay, with two ancestral groups, the Clodofoviete okay, and the Solanogasters. These organisms did not have a muscular foot, okay, and they did not have a shell. Okay. The shell and the muscular foot came after, so, but they did have a radula, they did have, you know, uh, at least they had spiracles, which would be shell-like material, okay, and that gave rise to the muscular foot and shell glands, okay, that we see in Polypocophora, the chitons, okay, and then as you progress, you start to see other things like gastropods and cephalopods and bivalves and scaphophoda, scaphophoda okay, um, develop, and with each development, either as a have a reduction in something, um, something is removed, something has been adjusted, okay, so you get tentacle formation off the foot, reduced head, <clears throat> you just get uh, diversified nervous system, you get all kinds of things that are going on as we progress up the phylogenetic tree and become um, into a more modern forms that we see today, okay. All right, now we're going to switch gears just a little bit. We're still in Lophotrichozoan, but we're going to talk about another phyla, and that phyla is going to be Annelida, or Annelidae, okay? And the annelids are um, the worms, and worm-like organisms. And we're going from this uh, kind of two-body region pseudocelomates, okay, or coelomates with reduced columns, okay, to annelids which are coelomates and have actual body regions, distinct regions, distinct compartments, um, and, and that's where we're kind of progressing. So we're getting to a point where we're progressing into true coelomates, true body regions, true circulatory systems, um, and we're going to start to see some sensory development, different types of sensories. Now, all of that sounds like, well, what about cephalopods? We already talked about that. Again, like I said before, cephalopods are an outgroup. Cephalopods are different from all the other mollusks, and it's kind of this just weird and diversification that's allowed for them to be very different than the other organisms which they belong to the, in that phylum. Okay, so next time we're going to talk about annelids.